Good afternoon and uh, welcome. My name is Gord Levi Sussex and I'd like to welcome you to this year's Sylvia Nash lecture on behalf of the IMLR. Um, this annual lecture um, is a fixture in our calendar. Uh, it was funded from the bequest of Sylvia Nash, who died in 1996, and she was an enthusiast. She was an enthusiastic linguist and a translator, and she was a member of the Friends of Germanic Studies at the then Institute of Germanic Studies. So when she died, she left a bequest uh, to the Institute, and from this we've been able to support graduate students and as well early career um, researchers uh, through fellowships uh, and through this annual competitive postgraduate lecture. The lecture has been held every year since 2001, and looking back through the titles gives you a wonderful overview of the breadth and the richness of what's currently going on uh, in graduate research. So I had a quick look, and the last 10 years alone um, have been looking at at film in the generation of 1968, Weimar Germany, medieval imaginations of the Iberia, the literature of the Saint-Fin de Siècle, Heinrich von Kleist, Alexander von Humboldt, gender and memory studies, Jean-Paul, Nietzsche, and Martin Buber. So today's lecture is definitely going to contribute to the richness and breadth of this enormous field. And I really am delighted to introduce this year's Sylvia Nash lecturer, it's Rosalind Beckwith. And Rosalind is in the fourth year of her PhD at Swansea. Her research project is entitled Remembering the Queen of Hearts, or the Queens of Hearts, rather, a comparative study of cultural afterlives of Queen Louise of Prussia and Empress Elizabeth of Austria. And Rosalind brings to this um, a unique interdisciplinary approach. She looks at these two figures through literary and film studies, history and memory studies. She's presented her research at various conferences at the, in the UK and as well as in Germany. And she's published an article in German Life and Letters it was entitled The New Prussian Renaissance, Literary Commemorations of Queen Louise, and it was published last year, 2021. And there's another article also on Queen Louise forthcoming. Today, however, we're going to hear about the other focal figure of Rosalind's research, Empress Elizabeth of Austria. So we very much look forward to this, Rosalind, and especially after you've given us your catchy title, Sex and the Sissy. So I would just like to begin by thanking Gordela and, and to the Nash Committee itself for inviting me to present my research today as part of the Sylvia Nash Lecture. It's such an honour and I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity. I would also like to welcome you all to this lecture, which examines the postmodern literary commemorations of El Empress Elizabeth of Austria, or as she is more commonly known, Sisi. Today, we will be moving away from dwelling solely on the past and offering an idealised view of the Austrian monarch, as has become the popular convention within her commemorative corpus. Instead, I will be introducing you to a new incarnation of the Sisi myth, arguing that the fairy tale image most prominently incarnated by Romy Schneider in the famous CC trilogy of films of the 1950s is beginning to wear thin. While many would suggest that the idealized CC figure continues to dominate her corpus, a new more subversive and controversial Empress Elizabeth is beginning to emerge, a sexed up CC for the 21st century. To begin with, though, and apologies if you are all very passionate CC enthusiasts, I'm going to offer a brief overview of the Empress's life and the way in which she has become a key signifier of Austrian identity. These pictures, for example, demonstrate how her appearance continues to dominate the visual landscape of Vienna and how CC has become a marketable icon for the Viennese tourist industry. In short, she has become what Pierre Nora terms a lieu de memoir, 
or site of memory, defined as any significant entity, whether material or non-material in nature, which by dint of human will or the work of time has become a symbolic element of the memorial heritage of any community. However, by their nature, lieu de memoir are not static, and in order for a site, of, site to remain active within the national consciousness, it must not be allowed to become stagnant. Even a figure such as Sisi needs to be continually revitalised and reimagined for new audiences. And we will see in the texts explored in this lecture that fresh approaches are appearing within her corpus, reflecting Anna Fuchs and Mary Cosgrove's theories, theory of memory contests, challenging the accepted narrative of the past. So for a little context, Empress Elizabeth was born in 1837 in Munich into the Royal Wittelsbach family. As the fourth child of the eccentric Herzog Max in Bayern, Princess Sisi was allowed a rather liberal and supposedly idyllic childhood in which she was free to pursue her mostly outdoor passions without the restraint one might expect to be imposed upon a 19th century princess. As their mothers were sisters, Princess Nene, Sisi's older sister, was expected to marry her cousin Kaiser Franz Josef of Austria. When the young Kaiser met both sisters at Bad Ischl in 1853, though, it's claimed that he fell instantly in love with the 15-year-old Elizabeth and instead chose her as his bride. Now, this is the part where the fairy tale begins to veer slightly off course. After the fairy tale wedding, the strict courtly life of a Habsburg empress did not entirely suit Cece. And despite fulfilling her first duty as an empress, providing a male heir, she was deeply dissatisfied with her life. She travelled extensively to simultaneously escape the strictures of court and recover from many varying and possibly psychosomatic illnesses. Much of her fame can be attrib attributed to her renowned beauty, but its pursuit also came at a great cost to her. To attain her own unhealthy beauty ideals, she constantly undertook extreme starvation diets and excessive exercise, which led to serious physical health problems, including rheumatism and edema. Indeed, Empress Elizabeth, whose BMI never exceeded 16.9 and a healthy BMI traditionally falls between 20 and 25, would fit all of the diagnostic criteria required for a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa today. Nevertheless, tour guides at the Sisi Museum in Vienna continue to claim that she could not have had an eating disorder because she enjoyed sweets. Even Martin Rady in his recent book on the Habsburgs alleges that she was neither too thin for the corsets of the time nor anorexic. I hope it's becoming evident that there is quite a discrepancy between the image marketed by Vienna and the historical Empress Elizabeth's experiences. Cece's life was also marked by tragic loss. Her two-year-old eldest daughter, Sophie, died when the Empress was only 19. And then in 1889, her son, Crown Prince Rudolf, died in a murder-suicide pact in Meierling. The next decade was one of mourning and deep periods of depression for the Empress. She also suffered from constant pain from her many illnesses, leaving her reliant on cocaine inje injections, a common remedy at the time. Sisi was eventually assassinated by an Italian anarchist on the banks of Lake Geneva in 1898. What I hope this brief overview of the Empress's life has exposed is that Sisi's life differs starkly from what we may expect. In spite of her personal struggles, the image that dominates her narrative, particularly in the Austrian collective consciousness, is that of the romanticised fairy tale figure embodied by Romy Schneider in Ernst Marischka's Sisi trilogy from 1955 to 57, which became the most commercially successful German films of the 1950s, despite being dismissed as kitschy and trivial by critics. These films focus solely on Sisi's early life, portraying her experience of meeting the Kaiser, falling in love and her early marriage. The closest that they come to introducing tr trouble into the idealised narrative is through their portrayal of Sisi's difficult relationship with her mother-in-law, Sophie, who takes the role of the wicked stepmother in the films, the antagonist of the Sisi or Cinderella figure. 
The final film also subtly touches on the Empress's poor health, showing her travels to Madeira and Corfu to recover from an unspecified illness. This is, however, quickly dismissed, and Marishka does not allow the dark elements of the real Empress's life any space in his films. The films very much sell the fairy tale version of Austrian history. By offering picturesque images of Austrian and Bavarian scenery, sumptuous costumes, authentic settings, and high romance, they also exemplify the popular post war Heimat film genre. Heimat films typically allowed West German and Austrian viewers in the 1950s and early 1960s to escape the struggles of their own lives and indulge in a sense of nostalgia for an idealised world. In this way, they can also perhaps be seen to be feeding into the idea of the Austrian Opfertiser, which predominantly argued that the Austrians were the first victims of Nazism, distancing Austria's historic trajectory from that of Germany and its Sonderweg. While the CC trilogy offered an idealised, nostalgic view of Austrian identity in the 1950s, they continued to occupy a position of prominence within the national narrative today as evidenced by their presence in the annual Christmas television schedules in both Austria and Germany. In spite of this, new approaches are emerging within Empress Elizabeth's corpus. In the next section of this lecture, I will explore how contemporary Austrian and occasionally German writers are starting to re-examine the Empress's biography from a more postmodern and subversive stance. So, to use Jean-Francois Lyotard's words, Postmodernism represents a rejection and incredulity towards the grand narratives of the past. And it seems therefore particularly fitting that the narrative of the golden Habsburg era should find itself the focus of postmodernist approaches. The works that will now be discussed also support Linda Hutchins' theory about the way in which postmodernist authors at once use and abuse, install and then destabilize conventions, convention in periodic ways. These texts draw upon prior knowledge of the Empress's myth, and yet, as we will see, they consistently distort and challenge our expectations. The fairy tale becomes rather more grim, if you'll excuse the pun. The first postmodern approach to the Empress, which I'd like to discuss, can be found in Lillian Fashinger's novel Wiener Passion, which appeared in 1999. The Austrian novelist, well known for her subversive approach to the glorified narratives of Austrian history, focuses in this novel on the lives of those who are ostracised by Viennese society. Composed as a frame narrative, the novel spans two time periods. In the 1990s, we meet Magnolia Brown, a black, half-Austrian, half-American singer who has come to Vienna to prepare for a role in an upcoming production in New York. She is introduced to Josef Horvat, a young hypochondriacal Viennese singing teacher, who is chiefly characterised by his obsessive devotion to both his deceased mother, a woman he falsely believed resembled Empress Elizabeth, and to the pursuit of music. While Manog Magnolia is initially repulsed by the antiquated attitudes of the city and the overt racism and xenophobia, xenophobia she experiences there, she eventually falls in love with Josef and her opinions of the city change even if the Viennese attitudes towards her do not. We leave the present day couple settled with a baby called Elizabeth, named after the Empress. Within the novel, Magnolia stumbles upon the diaries of her great grandmother, Rosa, which comprise the majority of the plot. Rosa is born into servitude in Bohemia in the 1800s, the illegitimate daughter of a cook and the master of the house. When both her parents die, she travels to Vienna to seek her fortune. At every turn, she is mistreated and abused, and yet she retains an idealistic view of the city until the end of her life. She takes on a wide range of roles in Vienna, from a starved maid in an affluent household to a prostitute working in the Prater, a maid in the Hofburg, and even Crown Prince Rudolf, Cece's son's mistress. She eventually marries a fellow Czech servant named Karel Havelka, and yet this marriage only leads to more unhappiness. Karel is unhealthily obsessed with Empress Elizabeth and seeks to transform his wife into her double. This fixation becomes increasingly dangerous and when he begins raping women resembling Cece, Rosa is forced to kill him to protect one of his victims, becoming a murderer herself. She is sentenced to death and the notebooks found by Magnolia are revealed to be her confession. 
The novel therefore introduces Cece as a shadowy figure at the edge of the narrative rather than a significant character to the plot. On the one hand, Cece's presence thus indicates that this is a work of historiographic metafiction, defined by Linda Hutchin as those well-known and popular novels, which are both intensely self-reflexive and yet paradoxically also lay claim to historical events and personages. Nevertheless, by switching the focus away from the often idealised historical figure onto two women segregated from society because of their otherness. Rosa because of her bohemian background and the fact that she is a servant, and Magnolia for the colour of her skin. Fashing it op adopts an even more starkly postmodern stance, further challenging the grand narratives of the past. It is Cece who is silenced here, while the ostracised are given a voice. Indeed, Fashing's approach allows her readers to observe the Empress from below, a, pa a practice Catriona Need Heal refers to as surveillance, by which she means the acute gaze from below that is deflationary, puncturing the hero heroic posture. While texts such as Stefan Zweig's Die Welt von Gestern and Josef Roth's Die Kapuzinergruft have repeatedly portrayed Vienna at the turn of the century as an era of creativity and progress, this account sheds light on the darker sides of the city, at times literally, as we're taken into the murky underworld of the sewers and the haunts of the prostitutes in the Prater. In so doing, Fashinger's novel exemplifies Marie-Louise Corker's theory of perverse nostalgia. This postmodern variant of nostalgia focuses deliberately, often sensationally, on the unsavoury aspects of the 19th century, creating a sinister wonderland populated by lurking monsters and hapless victims, rather than indulging in a rose-tinged view of the past. Cece therefore steps out from her idealised role of the fairy tale empress and emerges instead as a symbol to be manipulated by the characters' perspectives. Her presence is palpable across both time periods, allowing her to occupy a celebrity-like status, as much for those protagonists in the 20th century as those in the 19th. Mirroring the attitudes of their ancestors, the contemporary Vi Viennese citizens in this novel continue to gossip about the Empress's foibles, as they can list her weight and her health cures, and she seems to function as a focal point around which they build their lives. The fact that Magnolia and Yosef name their daughter Elizabeth at the end of the novel especially exemplify, exemplifies this nostalgic focus. Nevertheless, it is during Rose's 19th century narrative that we witness the increasing fetishisation and sexualisation of Cece, offering a contribution to this new postmodern memory contest, which is challenging the dominant memory mainstream. The contrast between the idealised woman of myth and the physical eroticism of the Empress is encapsula encapsulated by Rosa and her husband Carrel's opposing views of Cece. Their opinions seem to straddle the madonna whore dichotomy, first identified by Sigmund Freud, another historical figure who also hovers at the edges of Rosa's narrative. For Rosa, Cece is a saintly paragon, demonstrated in the prayers she is taught as a child, linking the Virgin Mary and unsere wunderschöne Kaiserin Cece, thereby placing the Empress in the position of a parental divine authority. Cece's beauty is thus again a key signifier of her identity. Even in later life, when Rosa is confronted with the visual reality of the Empress's ageing appearance, Rosa cannot seem to accept this challenge to her own conception of the Empress, describing her as die nicht mehr junge, doch gärtenschlanke und mir wunderschön erscheinende Kaiserin. The contrast between Sein and Schein is all important in this novel. To Rosa's husband, Karel, Empress Elizabeth is conversely the more sexualised figure of the Madonna whore dichotomy. His obsession begins early in childhood when he sees her as a four-year-old boy, perhaps again a nod to Freud, as this is the age when young boys supposedly develop the Oedipus complex, becoming sexually attracted to their mothers, again referencing the significance of her maternalism. Following that encounter, he spends decades lusting after her, after her, particularly drawn to the idea of becoming her coachman. Karel's interest in the Empress's schwarz-samtenen riding outfit and the sporenbestuckten Schnurstiefeln exemplify the stark contrast between the couple's conceptions of Cece, focusing on the erotic and the dark. Karel's fixation later leads him to increasingly performative expressions of his 
obsession. He forces Rosa to wear an imitation of Cece's wedding dress at their wedding before descending into a dangerous pattern of controlling behaviour and sexual fetishism, asking Rosa to lose weight to mimic Cece's body shape, to develop anemia, to imitate her pallor, and even to expose herself to draughts to bring on coughing fits. His controlling and fanatical behaviour leads to a severe lung infection, and yet Rosa continues to submit to his will. In this way, Rosa's devotion to both the patriarchal attitudes of the city and her husband, as well as to the Empress herself as an idealbild, literally destroys her health. When Rosa finds Carrel dressed in the Empress's clothes and wig, an example of transvestic fetishism, and the Empress herself later dies, this seems to spark a crisis for Carrel, and he descends into truly psychopathic behaviour. By seeking out and raping women who resemble the Empress, he reveals the depths to which such an obsession can lead. These scenes, which take us into the darkest parts of Vienna's history, also expose the way in which Empress Elizabeth has been transformed from the virginal ingenue figure portrayed by Romy Schneider into a sexualized victim, Karel's prey, an object to be used and abused. Faschinger can thus be seen to be using Karel as a metaphor for Vienna itself, which continues to manipulate the Empress's biography for its own largely financial purposes. This postmodern narrative thus takes the figure of the historical empress and turns the spotlight away from her and onto the way in which she has been manipulated to offer a romanticised sense of Austrian identity. It is therefore not the empress herself who is important here, but her symbolic function, a woman whose life can be plundered for her citizens' interests. The characters consistently overlook the controversial elements of the empress's life, for instance, her aged appearance and her depression, in the same way that Rosa and Magnolia choose to disregard the mistreatment they suffer in Vienna. In so doing, the characters become metonyms for Austrian society as a whole, which according to Faschinger prefers to disregard the more sordid reality of Viennese life in favour of a golden narrative in which fairy tales loom large. The next work of biofiction this lecture will examine also features the Empress, but in a rather different guise. This time Cece is even darker and more nightmarish than in Faschinger's novel. Linda Stift's Stierhunger, published in 2007, has nevertheless received much less critical interest than the former novel, in spite of the fact that her other works, such as Kein Einziger Tag, have led to her being considered part of the Nesbuschmutzer movement joining the ranks of Elfriede Jelinek and Thomas Bernhardt, who also take overtly critical approaches to Austrian society. At this point, I feel I should offer a trigger warning as this novel focuses rather explicitly on the protagonist's struggles with bulimia. This is partially the reason for the title, both a synonym for bulimia and a, an allusion to the novelist's own homeland, the Steiermark, a place and environment that Stift, a recovered bulimic herself states that she had to leave in order to recover from her own eating disorder. In this novel, Empress Elizabeth is pulled into the present day with no expl explanation for her transplantation. She appears as a mantilla-clad Viennese resident named Frau Hornems, a pseudonym Cici used historically to evade public attention. Her housekeeper, Ida, is also a woman summoned from the past, her name recalling Cici's own lady-in-waiting, Ida Ferenzi. The narrative, however, remains ambigu ambiguous throughout, and we never explicitly learn their true identities. The novel begins with a chance meeting outside a conditorei between our nameless protagonist and Frau Hornems, who recognises the form as bulimia from her scarred knuckles and invites her to share a piece of Google Hoop with her, seen here on the right of the slide. After this encounter, the protagonist is sucked into Frau Horn Ems's clutches as she drives her into a relapse of her bulimia and inveigles her into participating in her plans to illegally reclaim, reframe or destroy many of the ex exhibits relating to the Empress in Vienna. These include stealing an Entenpresse, a device used by the Empress to squeeze the juice out of a meat as a weight loss tool, pictured here in the middle, the Empress's cocaine syringe from the Sisi Museum on the left, and blowing up the Empress's statue in the Volksgarten on the right. Over the course of the novel, the protagonist falls increasingly under the power of Frau Hornems, losing her friends, her job and her home. 
eventually being forced to move into the Empress's apartment and surrender her agency entirely. As the narrator is increasingly annexed from her own reality, the past in the form of the Empress looms larger in her consciousness. In nightmarish and Kafkaesque scenes, a particularly significant illusion given Kafka's own famous Erzählung der Hungerkünstler and the feeling of paranoia and claustrophobia which suffuse the novel, the protagonist descends into a relapse of her bulimia. This is explicitly described with graphic and disturbing depictions of the condition. For instance, the protagonist describes how she vomits into screw-top jars, which she leaves around her room until the bestialische Gestank pervades all. Her descent into her eating disorder occurs in tandem with her subjugation by Frau Hohenems and her mania for controlling the memorial landscape surrounding Empress Elizabeth. This reaches its climax in a CC lookalike competition, when the narrator is forced to imitate her captor in order to win her body weight in chocolates. By the end of the narrative, the protagonist appears lost to her bulimia and helplessly controlled, helplessly trapped by the controlling empress figure. Her final attempt to escape is a failure, and in the last pages, the cycle starts again, with the empress bringing another emaciated girl home to share a slice of cake. This CC can therefore be considered a masochistic, sadistic presence preying on the protagonist's vulnerabilities. She is again a quasi-maternal figure, but rather than the saintly Madonna image that has dominated the Empress's corpus for decades, Stiff's narrative transforms CC into a frightening, controlling mother, again akin to a Freudian figure, or perhaps a matriarch from the Grimm's fairy tales jealous of the younger woman and seeking to manipulate her as a puppet. We can also see that Stift, like Fashinger, is also engaging with perverse nostalgia, reframing the past as a time of lurking monsters and hapless victims, to quote Corker once again. However, this time Cece is not just a minor cameo figure, instead she is transformed into the lurking monster herself, a stark vault fast within the Empress's corpus. Akin to Fashinger's novel, she is transformed from the Madonna into not just a sexualized creature, but an almost devilish temptress, thoroughly calling into question the idealizing commemorations once again. The Empress can also be considered to function as, an, as a personification of an eating disorder within the narrative, an almost parasitic presence draining the life from its host. Her actions and words when manipulating the unnamed protagonist are particularly redolent of the eating disorder voice, a term denoting the interior monologue common amongst eating disorder sufferers. Therese Waterhouse defines this as the near constant dialogue or self-talk that a person experiences as a result of the illness, which convinces sufferers to control their food and verbally abuses them with their worst fears when they try not to listen. Just as the protagonist berates herself for binging, ich fühlte mich wie ein uralter, klebriger Mulleimer, in dem die Abfälle verrotten, emotive, emotively dehumanizing herself, the Empress figure also treats her disdainfully. During the course of the narrative, their conversations become increasingly menacing, echoing this eating disordered interior monologue. Even Frau Horn Ems's attempts to blackmail the protagonist and manipulate her into a relapse by playing psychological mind games seem to fit with the cruel nightmare logic of the eating disordered voice. She begins by forcing the girl to eat more than she wishes, before mocking her for being greedy and refusing to share her own food and drink. Even praising the young girl's weight loss is clearly intended to further trigger the sufferer's eating disorder. Sie schob mit ihren behandschuten Fingern meinen Badmantel auseinander. Sie haben ja abgenommen? Bravo! The juxtaposition of the Empress's gloved fingers with the vulnerability of the protagonist's near nudity only stresses the power imbalance and the mastery the Empress seems to hold over her. In this way, the Empress who lurks outside cake shops to entice young girls with eating disorders into relapsing becomes not only a physical embodiment of an eating disorder, but also a dark parody of her historical self. Stift shifts the focus from Cece's beauty, the most common marker of her identity, onto her controlling manipulative behaviour, a trait which is present in the Empress's biographies, but which is all too often overlooked by the idealising narrative dominating the corpus. 
Shift CC is therefore reframed as a calculating and devious monster, seeming to delight in exerting control over others. Once again, then, the Empress is removed from her pedestal and transformed to allow readers to reimagine the past in a darkly postmodern manner. While Vienna and the tourist industry remain reluctant to admit that Cece could have suffered from an eating disorder at all, Schiff's novel turns the spotlight on this taboo topic in the corpus and lays bare the suffering at the heart of her biography, albeit at one remove. It also offers an iconoclastic and revisionist approach to the idealised version of Austrian history so prominent in the national collective consciousness, challenging the idea of the fairy tale princess who became Austria's Queen of Hearts. This CC is more akin to the cannibalistic witch feeding up Hansel and Gretel rather than Cinderella dreaming of her happily ever after. The final novel I will be discussing is the tie-in novel linked to the popular television series Sisi das Dunkle Versprechen, broadcast on RTL in December 2021 and co-developed by ORF. As we will see, Robert Krauser and Elena Hell, who also wrote the screenplay for the television programme, continue in the traditions of the previous postmodern novels involving the Empress by reworking her legend although they are seemingly less intent on dismissing some of the conventions of the past. This novel thus begins with a statement, Dies ist nicht die wahre Geschichte der Kaiserin Elisabeth. Dies ist eine ihre Legenden. Personen, Orte und Ereignisse sind teils der Historie entlehnt, teils stark verändert, teils frei erfunden. As a consequence, this portrayal is clearly engaging with the myth and adapting the Empress's legend for contemporary tastes. A CC for the Netflix age, perhaps? It has garnered reviews comparing it with sexualized historical blockbuster novels and television series, referring to it as Fifty Shades of CC and even Ein Sorghafte Roman zwischen Bridgerton, The Crown und Game of Thrones. As we will see, it is this novel that really exemplifies the way in which postmodern approaches are increasingly sexing up the past, and yet it is not as progressive as it may at first appear. In many ways, this novel engages with the more traditional conventions of the corpus, for instance, repositioning the Empress as the protagonist of her own biography. The narrative also mirrors the focus of the first Mariska CC film by centering on the beginnings of Franz Josef and Empress Elizabeth's romance and their marriage. Even the characterization of the Empress mimics Romy Schneider's depiction to a certain extent, given that Cece is once again represented as a young girl, more suited to a bourgeois life than the aristocratic court, and is portrayed as an innocent entering into the lion's den of life at the Hofburg. It is not, however, the chaste affair that viewers of the Mariska films have come to expect. From the opening scene, we are introduced to the teenage Elizabeth masturbating for the first time directly paralleling the scene in Netflix's Bridgerton when its heroine, Daphne Bridgerton, rather controversially discovered self-pleasure on screen. Sex represents a key theme of the narrative. Cece's original object of desire is, however, not her future husband, but a horse breeder. This is nevertheless shown to be a passing fancy, and when she meets Franz Josef in Bad Ischl, despite the fact that Franz is expected to propose to her sister, Nene, the couple are overcome by, by their feelings, and it is Cici to whom the Empress proposes. The narrative is therefore not a linear progression from love at first sight to the fairy tale wedding, concluding with a happily ever after. Instead, the characters are shown to be more nuanced and psychologically motivated than in previous literary and filmic works. Even before their engagement, Cece catches a glimpse of Franz Josef in the midst of an orgy while, in bad, while at Bad Ischl, a state of affairs that she simply cannot understand given her innocence. While Franz Josef is transformed into a man who enjoys regular extramarital sexual exploits, takes opium and cocaine and drinks heavily as a way of coping with the pressures of his imperial position, Cece is also allowed to transgress her traditional role. This is particularly evident in her interactions with the fictionalised prostitute Fanny. When Cece's father, Duke Max, a staunch Republican, casts his daughter's fiancé from their house, early on in their engagement, it is to the brothel that Franz Josef flees. Cece follows in pursuit and even speaks to Fanny, the woman engaged by her future husband. 
In a rather shocking take on the corpus, Miss Cece asked the more sexually experienced woman to teach her how to satisfy France in the bedroom. Later, Cece takes this still further by employing Fanny to act the part of her lady-in-waiting, in order that she, Cece, is able to feel less alone in the unfriendly Habsburg court. Several comedic scenes ensue, for instance, when Fanny's bags are checked on arriving at the Hofburg and her sex toys are discovered. She claims that one of them is a hairdressing implement. Eventually, the pretense is discovered and Fanny is sent home, leaving Cece isolated and friendless in Vienna. The idea of the prostitute representing a more comforting moral presence than the Habsburg aristocracy again reflects the traits of the conventional corpus, which has frequently positioned Cece as the antagonist of the outdated, etiquette-driven Viennese courtiers. The rest of the narrative follows Franz Josef trying to, vo trying to avoid his young wife, refusing to consummate their marriage, seeming out seemingly out of fear that everyone he loves will be doomed to suffer. As early in the narrative, he is cursed by a Hungarian woman, the Dunkle Versprechen of the title. At the same time, though, Cece is intent on experiencing, a, experiencing her marriage in the fullest of senses. This is thus again reminiscent of the plot of Bridgerton, where the Duke character is also reluctant to consummate his marriage fully in order to avoid having children, thereby going against his wife's wishes. In this way, we can see how Hell and Krause's postmodern novel, to a certain extent, reframes the traditional gender dynamics of the corpus, recasting Franz Josef as the pursued rather than the pursuer. Nevertheless, patriarchal stru structures remain dominant, given that even this state of affairs is portrayed as extraordinary, and the emperor clearly continues to possess the real power here having his best friend punished for insubordination, seemingly out of sexual frustration. As the novel finishes with Cece begging her husband to Liebe mich, it is clear that Cece remains reliant on her husband to take action, seemingly incapable of exerting agency herself. In an echo of the earlier conventions of the Empress's corpus, misogyny thus still plays an active role here, in spite of the novel's seemingly progressive approach. France in particular embodies these outdated attitudes, consistently engaging in benevolent sexism, confining his wife to the role of an object to be admired for her appearance alone. We are told, for instance, that wie eine Prinzessin in einem magischen Märchenschloss war sie Franz vorgekommen. Once again, this empress is expected to submit to her husband's wishes, remain quiet and function simply as a decorativa's bivac and a zeiter and his manners. Even the descriptions of Francis's lustful pleasure in his wife's appearance, signalling that Cece has finally won him over, continue to objectify her and exemplify Laura Mulvey's theory of the male gaze. Im Seeauerhaus wäre es ihm nie möglich gewesen, ihr so nah zu sein, ihren Körper so unverhohlen zu inspizieren, ihre Brust hoben senkte sich unter ihrem Atem. It is evident that even the most boundary-breaking depiction of the Empress remains limited by the contemporary society's somewhat misogynistic expectations of female royalty. An appetite seemingly remains for the fairy tale where the princess is always the damsel in distress and requires rescue from a stronger man while she simply brushes her hair prettily. This narrative is thus not as starkly or subversively postmodern as the two preceding novels, and yet the way in which Hell and Krauser reimagine the Empress as a stronger female presence within a traditionally patriarchal world does fit in with a memory contest which is challenging the conventions of the corpus. While in the 1950s CC films, an idealised version of the Empress allowed Austrian viewers to engage with their own history and national identity in a positive manner, particularly given the shaky foundations upon which the Second Austrian Republic was built, the new conception of CC allows contemporary Austrians to reframe their national founding mother figure as a woman embodying more modern values. This Cece is a brave, confident young woman, a Kaiserin die mehr konnte als nur lächeln und den Mund halten. In this portrayal, she becomes a rather anachronistically sex-positive, progressive egalitarian, more comfortable in the company of her prostitute friend than the Viennese courtiers. And yet, this expansion of her agency remains restricted by the context of the patriarchal setting. 
hegemonic attitudes towards gender roles remain dominant when it comes to royal women, even when the women in question are increasingly stepping out of their prescribed spheres of influence. To draw these texts together into a form of conclusion, I hope that this afternoon's presenta presentation has offered an insight into the changing and increasingly postmodern attitudes towards Empress Elizabeth of Austria. These three novels all exemplify how royal and national history is no longer sacrosanct and instead has become subject to rewritings and revisions, which reimagine the Empress in a way that can tell us something about contemporary Austria and Austrians, whether that be about the values they celebrate or the dangers of idealising the past. They also all exemplify a changing approach to history, where we are increasingly focusing on the physicality of the past, getting up close and personal to put it colloquially. While there remains an appetite for the fairy tale, there is also a growing subversive desire to reveal the tarnish behind the polish of the crown. Indeed, this links directly with a practice similarly observed within celebrity studies. Steve Cross and Joe Littler's remark on the use of schadenfreude within celebrity culture, observing that the act of gleefully watching or pushing celebrities from their pedestals has become a major cultural trope. Audiences in the postmodern age thus seem to delight in observing the powerful made less powerful. Even within the very traditional genre of royal biographies and fiction, we can see therefore that subversion is increasingly required. This is nevertheless an ongoing process of representation and revision, as the second book in the CC series by Helen Krauser, entitled CC Verlangen und Verrat, is due to be published in November, along with a second series of the accompanying television adaption. The Netflix series about CC, entitled The Empress, is also scheduled to be released in the coming months, as well as the film Corsage, which focuses on the Empress's more melancholic, older life. All of these adaptions seemingly focus on what is missing from the previous historical record. Postmodernism has ushered in this growing, somewhat intrusive appetite for the darker side of the fairy tale, the perverse nostalgia we have seen flourish in these texts. This is not simply linked to the Austrian na nation, however. For instance, in the last decade, we have witnessed how the crown pointed the camera at the intimate and occasionally scandalous details of the British Queen's private life. The recent film Spencer also explores Diana, Princess of Wales's bulimia in at times excruciating detail. Empress Elizabeth, the woman who has seemingly been eclipsed by her own myth for over a century, similarly seems finally able to return to prominence in a way that finally celebrates her idiosyncratic personality. It is significant that it is the darker elements of her biography, which were so carefully buried and glossed over, which are now drawing in new audiences. What was suppressed is now being forced to the surface, enabling her to function as a more empathetic anti-heroine for current tastes. Thank you so much for listening today. Well, many, many thanks indeed, Rosalind. That was a wonderful lecture. And um, I particularly like the fact that uh, you are pointing us to forthcoming publications and adaptations. And so we will be we will be following these and watching and reading them with a different knowledge than we would have had otherwise. Many, many thanks. So um, for uh, viewers of this lecture, uh, I'd just like to uh, say that Rosalind is very happy to um, answer any questions or, um, or receive your comments on this lecture. Um, and her address was on the first slide that was presented. Um, just to remind you of this, Rosalind, could you remind us of your address, please? It's 480444 at swansea.ac.uk. So that's 480444 at swansea.ac.uk. But you can also find me on Twitter as well, which, oh, there's my handle just there, at Beckwith Rosalind. Wonderful. There we are. And uh, we conclude this lecture with this last view of Elizabeth. Many, many thanks again, Rosalind.